Hi and welcome back to the channel. I've titled today's video The Promised Seed. The central theme of the Bible is laid out very early in Genesis. God created everything, including man, and it was all good. Shortly after creation, man fell, succumbing to the lies of Satan in the Garden of Eden. Immediately after the fall, God gives prophecy of a seed that will conquer Satan's seed. In Genesis 3.15 we read, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bru bruise his heel. This is God declaring a seed war. He's letting us know that Satan will have seed. Eve will have seed as well. Her seed, Jesus, will be victorious. Now this is a little bit of a side note, but I wanted to point this out. Another sister in Christ brought this to my attention. There was this operation, um both in the United States and around the world that had a name very similar to um, Seed War. And as you can see here, if you take Seed War and you reverse it to War on Seed, add some peas, and you get this. Now, if you take the peas out and turn them upside down, what do they look like? Now, I'm not saying that this is necessarily what's going on, but I think it is worth noting um, and considering. God prophetically declares that Eve will have seed in Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. The birth of this seed, Jesus, is told of first in Matthew, the 40th book of the Bible. The Bible often uses human biology as a prophetic framework. Human seed, which is a fetus, gestates for 40 weeks. I suggest that the 40 books might equal 40 weeks. Jesus is prophetically conceived in Genesis and physically born in Matthew. Right after a new baby is born, it cries out. Even though Jesus is born in Matthew 2, we don't hear him speak until Matthew 3.15. Genesis 3.15 to Matthew 3.15 is exactly 40 books. This is symbolic of Jesus' first words as the promised seed prophesied in Genesis 3.15. In the very next verse, we read that Jesus was, was baptized and the Spirit of God uh, descended like a dove, and lit on him. This verse illustrates how Jesus was baptized immediately after his um, quote-unquote birth as the promised seed, where he spoke for the first time in the New Testament scripture. This establishes the pattern for newly saved believers, which is repent and believe, which is confess with your mouth, and then be baptized. The following verse after that we hear um, God the Father say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I've mentioned this before, that every proud Papa loves to introduce his newborn son to the world. So Matthew 3.17 confirms that this passage, verses 15-17, through 17, is a type and shadow of the birth of God's prophetic promised seed, even though Jesus was about 30 years old at this point. The name Matthew in Hebrew means gift of God, and Jesus is the promised gift of God. So it is fitting that Jesus first appears in the book of Matthew. Matthew has some seed connections. Like we mentioned, it's the 40th book, which uh, relates to the gesta gestation of a human seed. The first verse of Matthew is verse 23. 1,146 of the entire Bible, and as you can see, this number has both a 23 and a 46 in it. The book of Matthew also contains 23,684 words, which contains a 23 and a backwards 46. So right there, we have three witnesses of Matthew's genetic or seed connections. And I included down here at the bottom that uh, the tool that I used to... Um, Find these numbers is called purebiblesearch.com. It's a very uh, powerful tool, um, and I've had a lot of fun with it, and I would encourage you to give it a try as well. In Matthew 1.23, we, re we read, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This spelling of Emmanuel appears only one time in Scripture, and it is in this verse, the 23rd verse of Matthew in the New Testament. And of course, 23 indicates a genetic connection. Context alone suggests that Matthew 1.23 holds possible genetic significance. 
Could it be that the numbers tell a story as well? It has been proposed by Ron Wyatt that Jesus had 24 chromosomes, 23 from Mary and one from God, God the Father, that is, via the Holy Spirit. So this number, the chapter and verse number, could be indicating um, Jesus's genetics. Next, let's look at Bethlehem and Nazareth. Each of these words appear in exactly 23 chapters of the Bible. The first mention of Nazareth is in Matthew 2.23, which again has this genetic significance because human cells have two sets of 23 chromosomes. The Hebrew word for seed is zera. It is hidden, scrambled within the word Nazareth. The Strong's number for Zara is H2233, which is a 23 and 23 intertwined, like human chromosomes. So the name Nazareth is hiding a seed. If we take Zara out of Nazareth, we are left with NATH, which is suggestive of Nathan and Nathaniel. Nathan means gift, of, means gift, and Nathaniel means gift of God. Nazareth is a word picture showing that the gift of God is a hidden seed. Just as you can't look at a seed and see the fruit it will produce, Jesus' true identity was not known to the world as he grew up in Nazareth. If we look at John 1.46, we read, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip sa saith unto him, Come and see. So in this verse here, we see that God is um, using wordplay because Nathanael has that N-A-T-H in it, um, and then he asks if anything good can come out of Nazareth, and Nazareth has the hidden seed in it, and then Philip says, come and see. So see what? A seed, the gift of a seed, Jesus Christ. In Luke 2, uh, verse 39, which you can see right there contains a 23, we read, and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Luke 2 is the 46th chapter of the New Testament, and this verse that contains 23 words, or this verse contains 23 words, and Nazareth is the 23rd word. So again, um, strong indicators that there is a genetic connection here. Why does any of this matter? Well, first of all, timing matters. The Bible was written before DNA was understood. The number of chromosomes, um, how its, its structure, its shape, its role in reproduction. And because all of these appear in the Bible in various hidden ways, God is showing that he had knowledge of DNA before man did. These findings reveal that God is claiming authorship of both the Bible and DNA. To know and love God means to give him credit for that which he has done. The numbers 23 and 46 um, indicates humans because um, God, is po God is pointing out that humans specifically are unique and special in his eyes. Other species have a different number of chromosomes. So when he uses 23 and 46 in scripture, he is speaking specifically about humans. As the promised seed, Jesus came to save humans. This may be important as the last days play out. Satan is well aware of the position humans hold in God's eyes. He may be attempting to alter human genomes in order to cause us to not be eligible to receive Jesus' grace and mercy through his death and resurrection. So going back to the beginning, the central theme of the Bible is that God's perfect creation was corrupted by sin. God sent his son Jesus as the promised seed to redeem mankind. Jesus, as this seed, was crucified and planted like a seed, in a tomb. On the third day he rose from the dead. His resurrection is a picture of a plant, or first fruits, springing forth from the seed in the ground, which is the tomb. This new plant is propagated by the sharing, hearing, and receiving of the gospel message. You can kind of see in this illustration that there's sort of a life cycle to the gospel. So, for that reason, I love to share the gospel or the good news at the end of each of my videos. If you are not familiar with the gospel, this is really important for you to understand. God created everything, including us. He loves each of us immensely. He made rules that we are to follow, the Ten Commandments. We have all broken those rules. The penalty is death. 
God knew that this would happen, so he sent his son Jesus to be sacrificed in our place. Jesus came and paid our death penalty. He did this for us as a free gift. We must receive this gift in order to be covered by Jesus' sacrifice. And this is really important. We do this by repenting of our sins, believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you haven't done this yet, please don't delay. Today could be your day of salvation. Thank you for joining us again for another video. Um, I hope to be back with you again soon. Thank you and God bless.